Yes, guys, you know what time it is. It's your boy, David, at the Irish Hotspot, Ireland's number one Spurs fan. And this evening, we bring you all the latest news linked to Tottenham, transfer news, club news, and there's a lot of club news out and about today. But And manager news as well, actually. Yeah, a short list, a lot of names being thrown around. No Jack today, as you can see, as Jacko's voice is gone, he left it in London. Left it all there at the Forest game and the AC Milan game, so we can forgive him for that. And we will be expecting him back here tomorrow with you guys, where we'll be all be doing a nice long debate show. As you can see, I've drafted in Adam William Kale. Not a bad uh, first round pick, I must say. Adam, how are you, my man? Yeah, not too bad, mate. Uh, I'm uh, all the happier for having had the opportunity to meet yourself and Jack for the first time over in London. I know a lot of people think it's they will think it's crazy that the two Irishmen supporting Spurs haven't actually met face to face before, but we got a chance to do it over in the uh, in the stadium that we all love, and it was a great experience in spite of the nil all draw. It was a you know the the highlight of the of of the evening was getting a chance to meet yourself and Jack. So that was that was great. That has me in good spirits still. No, it was it was actually great to meet you. When I met you, it was the first time I realized we met in person. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> and of course, we didn't even know we were on the same flight home until we got off at Dublin and then we met each other again. I'd That's say you right. were still ugly mug by then. <laughs> not a chance, not a chance. No, yeah, it was very, very, very strange, very fortuitous. But yeah, like, good to have the, the chats back on home soil as well. No, it was, it was. Well, look, let's see who's with us here this evening quickly, and then we'll start getting into the lineups and having or into the evening headlines and start having some discussions. Forgive me, I'm out of practice when you're away for a week, you forget a lot of things. Mick Hermanoff <laughs> says, Good evening, Jack and Dave. Big up, Mick. We've got Hotspur Jane in the house. Big up, lads, and everyone here. Come on, you Spurs. Big up, Welsh Gas. She says, Big up, lads. Come on, you Spurs. Big up to Jacob as well from United Spurs of America. We have, um, Jairaj Joshi in here. He says, Joshi in here, come on, you Spurs. Cynical Dad says, hi, peeps. Hope you're all having a good day. Big up. We've got Leo from Mile High Hotspur. Big up, my man. Good to see you. Phil Coy says, big up, lads. Have a great show. And as always, come on, you Spurs. It's going to be interesting how it all unfolds in the summer with Spurs. Just want to see some ambition for the club for once. But you know what, Phil? We're set for um, another period of um, uncertain times. You know, we're going to constantly have Transfer rumours linked to Harry Kane, constant speculation over who, what manager's going to be in place. So it looks like another summer of upheaval, Phil, which is not what we want, my man. But we need stability, but we seem to just, every season, every summer, it just descends into absolute chaos. Uh, Darren Caban says, please not Enrique. I think if Conte goes for Poch, but back him properly this time and get Dyer Davies Langley out on the first team, not good enough. Well, actually, I will be bringing you a short video on the back line and actually how costly it has been this season. So make sure you do stay tuned for that. And my belief is no manager will ever have a chance to succeed as long as these guys are still in the team and not replaced. Come this summer, my man, big yourself up. King Hoddle, good to see you in the building. Hopefully you're keeping well. Lucas Wells says, hello, lads. Daniel Sandoval says, big up. Uh, one love, come on, you Spurs. Drew Zillis says, big up, lads. Big yourself up. Pre Peter Simmons says, What's up? Big up, my man. Good to see you in the house. We've also got Stu Boy. Hello, sunshine. Come on, you Spurs. Big up, Stu. Dan Davenport says, yo, Dave, did you and Jack enjoy yourself in London? Yeah, look, Jack got the win. I didn't. I came back sour. I'm not going to lie. But, you know, Jack stayed for a few extra days, hung in there, and he got his reward, my man. We had a good time, though. Kev Williams says, I hate Arsenal. I think we all do, brother. <laughs> Bob Murphy says, big up, you Spurs. We've got King Hodley says the cup exits have um, obscured the fact that we won five of our last seven in the league. That's pretty good form, even if we aren't playing great football. It is, but I think, look, most people are fed up with top four, my man. I think most people now are at the stage where we're just itching for a trophy. And we had a good opportunity there with the FA Cup. And yet, once again, no one around the club seems to take it seriously. So I think that's where the frustration comes in, brother. We've got Derek Hutchinson as well. It's big up, Dave and Adam. And then we've got NB Sports TV, a Chelsea fan. Good to see you in the building. I hope you are keeping well. But look, we're going to start getting into some of the news. So here we go. Gary Jacob from the Times Tier 1 source says, Lewis Enrique would be keen on taking the Tottenham job. Jack Putbrook from the Athletic, also Tier 1, says, Lewis Enrique is the lead contender for the THFC job. Should Conte be sacked? Now, question to you, Adam. Luis Enrique is a very possession dominant manager who enjoys a 4 3 3 and is known for his time with Barcelona during the Messi Suarez name is here, uh, Neymar era, which is not a bad era to be a part of. Are Spurs capable of playing um, well right away under Enrique, or will it take time? 
Uh, well, I, th I think with any manager, it's going to take time. If we can't, if we can't be winning things with Conte, if, if we're if we're seeing a lot of dross games with Conte, I don't think like necessarily that just having the different tactics is going to make the, a great deal of difference. I think that that ultimately we've still got to we're like we're not very secure going forward with the fact that we have some piss poor defenders and keepers that need updating as well. So that you know, Forster's doing a great job in the last the last while. Like he's he's a fairly decent stand in, but he's not the future of Tottenham. And while we have um you know we were uh, the the sieve of a of a defense that we have, I think that uh, no matter who comes in, they're going to struggle. And I think that people like I, I know I know this, we're going to need to kind of give different answers for every uh, manager that's going to get put forward here. But at the same time, there's going to be a consistent theme, I think, for me, which is just that if you're going to replace Conte, first of all, you're 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 then pushing um, uh, like we have no guarantee. Yes, people are saying they're fairly certain that Conte is going to go, but we have no actual guarantee of that. He keeps saying that he wants to say he's saying that the fans are the ones that have lost patience, not him. If we're going to in like basically get so outraged that we're going to push him away it like we're, we're, we're pushing another manager out the door who is a serial winner right that is you know that we're then gonna it's gonna be embarrassing that he goes on somewhere else wins something wins a trophy with another team and we're that team that you know elite managers can't win anything with so does does the the, the, the likes of Luis Enrique inspire me into thinking, you know, he, well, he'll he'll come in and he'll do something, so it doesn't matter if Conte goes. Not really, to be honest. I, mean, I think that any manager that comes in is going to have the same problems that Conte has because we need we still need the backline sorted. Yeah, look, I 100% agree with that. First of all, I'm just going to give a bit of background on on Luis Enrique. So he started off his managerial career with uh, Roma one year. Um, they ended up suffering an embarrassing exit to Bratislava in the Champions League. Also had his problems with Totti there at the time, a club legend. Then he went on to Celta Vigo, where he spent one year finishing ninth, which was good for them. Then he had Barcelona for three years. Um, earlier on, his tactics were actually called into question, but then he sort of changed them up. Um, made made Messi, Messi and Neymar more inverted sort of wingers, which really helped that tree flourish. And then he actually went on to win... I think it was two Copa del Reyes, two La Ligas and a Champions League and also went on to equal Guardiola's 11 consecutive win um, wins at Barcelona as well. So he had a, he had a good time um, at Barcelona. Then he was um, in charge of Spain as well, where he famously picked the 24-man squad when he could have registered 26 for the Euros. Um, and they went out in the semi-finals and then, of course, the World Cup as well in the last 16 now, um, Luis Enrique, you know, he's he, he sort of adapted to wherever he's gone at Barcelona. He tried, to, it was more of a, a quick sort of, I wouldn't say a counter attacking style, but the transitions from defense to forward to the forwards w was, was very, very quick and very, very direct at times. And um, then with Spain, it sort of went into a bit more of a tick attacker. I think he is a manager that would probably adapt more so than an Antonio Conte to what he's got. But I ultimately agree with you, Adam. I actually think that, you know, no matter what manager walks in this door, are going to suffer the same problems, i.e. goalkeeper, i.e. centre-backs. And um, that defence, it needs massive overhaul. And plus, I would say that Luis Enrique is probably on a lot more on the front foot, I would say, tries to play on the front foot, than someone like an Antonio Conte, which is complete contrast to what we've already got, where Antonio Conte sort of likes to have all 11 men behind the ball. And someone like me, I can understand that. It's to protect the back line. But someone like Luis Enrique, I think you're going to have larger distances between the midfield and the back, and, and the back line and also the forward line not dropping nowhere near as deep, which will come with its own issues again defensively. But a number of things that have been a problem with that defence that predate Conte is like, you know, aerial ability with like with problems set crosses into the box set pieces, you know, early into the box. They've been a huge problem for us since since Jose Mourinho lapses of concentrations and asking these players to get out there and play weekend midweek. It seems to be a huge ask for these guys, and they've proven time and time that again they can't do it. So look, I, I would say whatever the next manager is, whoever the next manager is. I do think, you know, not only to the fans, but I also think that the board need to probably show that a bit of patience and a bit of time at them and give them at least two to three years to sort of build something and give us something going forward. 
Yeah, I feel I feel the exact same way. I think I, 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 the, the, the message that we're constantly being given from Conte is that he's he's very happy with what he what he's got. He's happy where he is. Yes, we know that behind the scenes that you know he's had some um, not even behind the scenes. It's it's you know it's quite evident that he's had some struggles with family issues, with health issues. He's really considering um, where he'd be happiest and what his um, maybe I think like down the line he's thinking to himself maybe maybe he wouldn't want to stay in England for too long. He wants to go back to Italy, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be at the end of the season. I think that if we manage to get top four, I think if we manage to uh, to do even uh, better than that and get and and top of Man United and get into the third spot, which is entirely possible, that he will still he will see that there's been progress made. I would consider that progress made. You know, from the from the from the previous season, we, like when Conte came in, we still needed about fifteen new players. Let's be honest; it wasn't just like you know, a couple of new guys needed to come in. Yeah. It, it, it was the painful re- rebuild that Potchwitz was talking about all those years ago. It was still necessary. That's what we're in the middle of at the moment, and we still didn't get everyone that we need. We still had a couple of signings that weren't Conte signings that were that are essentially. Um, you know, they're, they're not uh, didn't haven't worked out, which means there are still several new players that we need to get in and then we'll be able to see Conte do what Conte does best and you know and, and again it's you know it's not like he's come to Tottenham and suddenly he's not a great manager people need to realize that Conte is, is an absolutely exceptional manager and he just need, and he needs to be given the tools and he says that he's willing to 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 uh, stick around and and see the the project through it's mm-hmm. only it only seems to be the media and the fans that are doubting it so much and that are getting on his case and i just feel like no like he's not wrong when he says that we're we need to give him time we need to we need to be more patient and maybe the fact that we only have one game a week now um if we can get ourselves to third or fourth then maybe the fans will get behind him again uh, at the moment things just are incredibly incredibly toxic and uh it's you know we need to remember that that, that this time last season we were in a worse position and ended up fourth there's no reason to think that we won't end, won't stay in the top four as we are now, or potentially even get third, which would be progress on last season. Mm, for sure, for sure. Big up, Lewis. Good to see you in the build, my man. I haven't forgot. I will send you a message, brother. Big yourself up. Look, for me, I think. Look, regardless, we can't keep sacking managers every sixteen to eighteen months. It's not a good look. I think we will be going down a route of sort of. Fulham, you know, where does it stop? Does it become, does them periods of 18 to 16 months then start going to 14, 12, 8, you know, and look what ended up happening to Fulham. So it's definitely a route we can't keep going down as well because it affects our transfer window and every manager we change, it means we have more and more to do because they have different styles, different philosophies and stuff like that. So it just makes it harder. And also when you look at our team now, when you look at it, it actually resembles four or five different regimes. you got players there for Poch, Jose, some signed under Nuno and now Conte. When the next guy comes in, it's going to resemble that as well. Mm-hmm. What If you are going to get someone in here, what really needs to happen if you're not going to continue on the Antonio Conte project, Adam, for me, is what, what, what needs to happen is, is you get someone in like we done with Poch that time and you allow him to clear the decks with what he wants gone, like Pochettino was allowed to do that time with the likes of Adebayor, uh, Lewis Hopi and people like that. You would have to allow the next manager to do that, in my opinion. Whether Tottenham are willing to let someone do that, I wouldn't say so because they were not very quick to, in, in the transfer market to rectify a lot of errors that we do make, which then makes the manager's job even tougher at times as well. So, um, look, but saying all that, we, we do have other managerial targets to talk about that were linked with Tottenham. And this comes from Sky Sports News, Tier 2. They say Tottenham manager shortlist if Conte is sacked. Includes Mauricio Pochettino, Roberto De Zerbi, Luis Enrique, Thomas Tuchel, Marco Silva, Thomas Frank, and Ruben Amorim. Um, a, lo- a long list there. Some very attacking managers there. Is the likes of Marco Silva, uh, Ruben Amorim, De Zerbi, Pochettino, Luis Enrique. And then you've also got Thomas Tuchel and Thomas Frank in there. Not a bad list whatsoever. Um, so my question to you, Adam, is we spoke earlier about Enrique. And now we will speak. Um, we'll speak a little bit later on on, on Poch. But is there anyone else out of this list that has maybe caught your eye that you wouldn't mind, you know, getting behind or giving a go at Tottenham? Not really. I think we don't want to end up in the exact same situation as Chelsea, where they just they bring in the Brighton manager. You know, Brighton doing incredible things, boxing above their weight, and you know, like but that, the, the the last manager that they had, which was obviously Potter, did did an incredibly good job with them. 
Um, Deservey's come in and is doing, you know, just as good a job, you know, if not slightly better. But it's, uh, you know, the, the consistency, the, the consistent thing there is the team. And I, and, and I think Brighton do things incredibly well behind the scenes. The way that they're run, they have a philosophy that they stick to. I don't think that we should make the mistake that Chelsea didn't think that just because Deserve is doing well with Brighton means that he'll come in and be an absolutely sensational manager for us. Yeah. Um, I think that Thomas Tuchel would leave an incredible sour taste in our mouths, let's be fair, especially but you know, being an ex-Chelsea uh, ex manager, but also the uh, the scuffle that he had with uh, with Conte on the sidelines. For me, I'll always well, back Conte. He's a Spurs fan, though, Adam. He's a Spurs fan? Tuchel. Mm, well, he, he's, he's, I, I, from, from, from recollection, he's had an awful lot of uh, negative things to say about Spurs in, in press conferences. He's never taken us, he never seems to have taken us too seriously. Um, you know, so I, I, I think that it's... Um, I, I think that if, if if he if he went back to I, I think it is crazy that Chelsea sacked him in the first place. I really do. I think it's absolutely mental. Um, off the back of a Champions League win, but um, I'm not. I, I just feel like it'll be really really sour. And and again, it's another one of those things where like in this generation, I know I understand how Spurs fans completely not really hate Arsenal. They're our rivals. I get it. But for me personally, as someone who you know, I never, I, I, I didn't live in London, so I don't have that kind of animosity with, with the Arsenal fans living there in the city. And I also, you know, like at the time, like Arsenal right now are not the the threat that they were 20 years ago. And so I have much more of a kind of a, a feeling of animosity towards Chelsea. Like for me, Chelsea are the team that I, I hate the most. There's a respect for Arsenal in spite of the fact that I don't actually, you know, we, we don't like them. It's their nemesis. That's fine. But there's, a, there's something about Chelsea that is just really, they're like, they make me sick to my stomach. And then having, an, a, you know, constantly going back to former Chelsea managers and bringing them in, like we've already done that with Conte as well, which is unpleasant, but, you know, constantly going to the former Chelsea managers and bringing them in, that would, you know, I just feel like it's just, it's just, it's, they'll hold it over, they're consistently hold it over our heads, and it's just, you know, everything about it just feels really, really rotten and awful to me. Um, well, and then when the other man... Looking at the way he plays, though, Adam, quickly, you know, he mm. does play with that sort of three centre-backs, two wing-backs, so it wouldn't be as much of a drastic change in terms of transfer, in terms of recruitment, right? It's sort of he can pick up from where, where Conte's left off and sort of build on on, on, on what, what, what we've done so far underneath the Conte regime. I think we could do that better under Pochettino, though, in fairness. We saw how well Pochettino did with us, you know, in, in this previous, uh, um, you know, incarnation. And if he was to come along again, I don't see any reason not to, to, you know, not to believe that he couldn't go on and do the incredible things that he, he had every intention of doing once he got backed. And I think also with, with a, a Pochettino team, you're talking about incredibly attractive, incredibly, incredibly front football and we wouldn't even have to go out and spend crazy amounts of money on center backs because he would likely play with a back four he played the four two three one again so and with the four two three one like I, i've said this a few times i would I, at the moment i genuinely think that we should back conte keep conte there in conte we trust all of that that's where my hope has been for the last year and a half right or if if Pochettino does come back, it's a little bit of a sort of a, 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 a fantasy return. You know, it'll be there was there, there would be something heartwarming about it. And if he did come back, we would be playing. All we would have to do is get in one exceptional centre back because we all, already would have Romero on the right. Romero plays in a back four for Argentina, so we know that he's capable of doing it. And then we would have Destiny Udoji out on the left. We would have an option of. Emerson or Poro out on the right, depending on whether we wanted to be defensive or attacking. Mm -hmm. Then we have all we've so many good central midfielders in fairness to us. And then you so that's in, 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 the, in the double pivot. And then imagine having all four of our excellent uh, um, attackers on the pitch at the same time. You have a three of Son, Kane and Kulisevsky. And mm -hmm. then you have Richarlison playing in his Brazilian position where he scores absolutely insane goals, mm -hmm. right? I'm th look, imagine that team. The only two pieces that are missing then are a keeper and a, and a left-sided centre-back. And we don't have to go out and break the bank and get two good centre-backs, which, which we would need playing with the back three. We go out and we get one. We get a Josco Guardiola or we get a, a, an Evan and Dicker. And then our back line suddenly looks insane in a back four. And then you replace the keeper with, you know, with, with, with whoever the next generation of keeper is. Suddenly the team is absolute sauce. 
for me, I, I disagree slightly on, on, on the two centre-backs. I think we def definitely still need two centre-backs because for me, you know, no, what, no matter what manager is going to come in here, we know Pochettino used to like to rotate in the, in the FA Cup and then the League Cup didn't really take them too seriously. It was Champions League and Premier League his focus was on. And so we know that inevitably you're still going to, if you don't sign two centre-backs, you're still looking at a Dyer, a Davies, a Sanchez, if not two of them hanging around. And for me... I just don't think any of them are good enough what, what, whatsoever. So I still they don't do need to be first teamers, though, is the thing. If we bring in two two centre backs, it can be one absolute world class centre back like a Josh yeah. Guardiola, and then you bring in another centre back that's better than Dyer and Davies, which is not yeah. difficult to do, but it doesn't have to be a starter. Do you know what I mean? It can be some some young hot shot like like Romero, who but you know someone that we can get for for less money that we're not going to break the bank on, and they can be on the bench capable of rotating with either of those two players given the chance you know you, you could bring in a, a Joachim Anderson or a, or a, a, a yep. Gwayne do you know what I mean you bring in one of those lads and you have them playing whenever we need them to rotate with one of our main two but you don't have to break the back if we stick with a back three we have to go out and get two exceptional center backs yeah yeah uh, look, look uh, I, I agree with that but you know for me I think we should sign two Two exceptional centre backs, anyway. If we have any sort of serious ambition to um, lift some trophies, look, I don't think there's a lot for Potts to work. Would be interesting to see whether he could work with someone like Gill, have him as Kane's understudy in that sort of cam role. Um, you know, Dane Scarlett coming through, Troy Parrott, who we're going to be talking about, Alfie Devine, Harvey White, Jed Spence. So it'd be interesting to see if they if he could work with any of them because he has worked with a lot of youngsters. In his past, I mean, famously, he ended up creating half of England squad there at one stage, all, all youngsters that he worked with and sort of, you know, helped develop and stuff like that. So, but the only, my, my, my only thing is, is I'm not, the second time, they do say in football, I'll never go back. The second mm. time is more out, out of, um, more, more being romantic than logical, I would say. So I do have my reservations on that. What about someone like Robert, uh, Robert De Zerbe at, at, at Brighton? Because... I think the question mark is 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 he being is he the beneficiary of what Harry Potter at Brighton created and left there, or is he as good as Pete as 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 uh, Brighton are making him out to be right now? I think it has a lot to do with what um what like Sean Butler was posting on on on, uh, on his Tottenham walks earlier on today uh, on, uh, on on Spurs talk show, and one of the things he said was that the best thing that we could possibly do is develop a philosophy to build everything around. So when you're bringing in the players, you're not bringing in the players for the manager, you're bringing in the players for the philosophy, because if as long as you're consistent with the philosophy, every piece you bring in will always fit together. And I think with Brighton, they have managed to have that where they've been in very, they've been very, very intelligent from the boardroom down. And so they have their philosophy. They've brought in the exact right players to replace the ones they've lost. When they send out a Kukurea or they, you know, whoever it is yeah. that, that they lose, lose a Basuma, they know exactly who they want to bring in and fit into those positions. And it wouldn't make a difference, what, you know, which which manager they yeah. had. And presumably, when they go for managers again, it's going it's going for a manager with the philosophy they have in terms of the way they want to play and the ambition they have and the DNA of the club. And so I think Should that irrespective. Should that just quickly, because you're absolutely spot on on that. Like, you know, when it comes to uh, Brighton's recruitment, that's actually devised by the owner. And yeah. uh, from whatever company he was in before, it was sort of to do with numbers and statistics and stuff like that. And he carried that over into the recruitment side. And anyone that's involved with it are not allowed to speak about it whatsoever. They're all under NDAs because mm -hmm. it works so well. Um, you know, and that, that's from the youth system right the way through. That scouting department, um, you know, identifies players just mainly purely on statistics alone. But they, they had, no one's sort of been able to work out the secret formula. So I mm. do think that they sort of give any manager that sort of comes in a chance to succeed. But Adam, yeah. surely then that's the sort of model that Tottenham should look to create, where you're just bringing in quality player after quality player, um, quality player with potential after quality player with potential, and then that way any manager succeeds. Do you do you see Tottenham ever being able to uh, adapt a sort of method like that? I think that it's entirely possible. I think that that's something that is 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 completely true, especially given given Sean's th theory, and and he's totally right that the players outlive the manager. The, when when the managers tend to not stay more than eighteen to twenty four months, and the players are given contracts that are up to five years, then maybe six years in some cases, then it means the players are going to out outlive the manager. So why are you building a team around the manager's philosophy when the players are the ones that are going to be there longer, and the board are going to be there even longer than that? There needs to be a consistency 
in the the style the methodology what way do you want your team to play and we know as spurs fans what we want to see is free-flowing attacking football that's what that, that is in our dna it's what we all want and so you need to build the philosophy around that and it means that uh it, if we if we can have that mentality going into uh, and all of our recruitment from the manager to the players yeah it's entirely possible that we can over time do the same thing that arsenal did arsenal are putting us to shame right now with the way that they've backed their manager stuck to their philosophy brought in the players that he needed based on the way that they uh, that they they want to play and they're doing exactly what we would love to be doing right now which is completely showing everybody up including man city and liverpool who thought who everyone thought was gonna they were gonna run away with you know but the problem at the moment is i think that the, our our fans are way way too divided and we need to see a little bit more loyalty irrespective of what we decide to do because if we end up deciding to go with a project manager and building things slowly fans are going to be complaining that it's going to take another three years before we get anywhere near a trophy or, or five years or whatever it is in terms of in terms of that project so what do we want do we want to to have a project or do we want to go and win silverware immediately? You're not guaranteed the silverware, unfortunately, at the, in, in this day and age. It's just too difficult to 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 play against the big boys. If you want to do if you want to do things um, and build it up, then we need to have that patience that Conte is calling for. And if he's willing to stick around, I don't see any reason not to not to back him through 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 the whole thing. Mm -hmm. In terms of bringing, you know, is it is it a bad idea to go backwards in terms of bringing Poch back? Well, look, it worked for Chelsea and 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 uh, bringing back uh, Jose, right? I mean. It's it, it's not it's not always a negative thing to go back to to especially when if Poch is serious about having unfinished business and he mm -hmm. genuinely wants to see amazing things happen for Spurs. I believe you dream hard enough and you'll and you'll achieve it. And I think that that's what he really wants. I just question how much has really changed since he sort of left us or since he was sacked. You know, there's players mm -hmm. there that sort of helped get him the sack. I'm not sure how many of them he's willing to sort of work with. I think he'll want a lot of them cleared out. I'm fearful that they're the ones we want cleared out, right? Yeah, they're the ones I want cleared out as exactly. well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but whether whether Tottenham will do that this summer remains to be seen. I, I, I'm 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 in fear that someone like Harry Weeks might be drafted back in, which I don't want anywhere near the team. Absolutely. The ben benefits of him being shipped out and away from Tottenham Hotspur altogether. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm I'm torn on Potch. I mean, if he comes back, I'll get behind him. I, I do see some of the benefits of bringing him back. But I'm just worried that it's more romantical than logical. What about um other names that were linked? Um, so look, Roberto De Zerbi, I think me, I would write him off. Mm -hmm. I think he's more one that's been a beneficiary of Brighton's superb scouting department that is derived from the owner. Luis Enrique, again, he's another one that has worked with a lot of you over his times. He bought through some at Barcelona there. He's brought some um to 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 international cup systems with him with him with Spain the likes of Pedri and Gavi people like that so he will work with you some youngsters as well so again you know some of the youngsters I mentioned I think it'll be good for them as well what about Marco Silva Thomas Frank or Ruben um Amarin because for me I'll be honest when I look at them sort of names Adam I think if there's a big player that they don't want to use I think Tottenham we'll have to end up backing them like what happened with Arteta and Aubameyang at Arsenal, what happened with Ronaldo and Ten Hag at Man United. Um, and, you know, a manager like that, we, we'd have to do something like that for, whether it's, whether it's like a Kane because they're unhappy with the contract situation, whether it's like a Sonny, you know, something like that. I'm not sure Tottenham would be willing to be rootless enough to get rid of one of their prized assets if... If, if they have problems with one of these managers, which I think is what ultimately they need. Like I said, Ten Hag with Ronaldo at United and Arsenal with a boomy or a Teta with Arsenal, uh, with a boomyang at Arsenal. For me, look, I like the job Marco Silva has done, has done at Fulham. Uh, I like the football he plays. I like some of the players that they brought in. Again, I'm just, I, I'm not sure if to step up is it too much, same as Thomas Frank. And Ruben Amarim, I, I struggle to see how his system would work in the Premier League. I mean, it's all right doing it in Portugal. Not sure how well it's going to stack up in the Premier League, though, Adam. Yeah, I, th I feel exactly the same about about Ruben Amorim for sure. I mean, you can't. There's no. There's no one to one comparison. You know, you're Portuguese. It's not even like he's 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 done it in La Liga or anything like that. You know, the Portuguese league. There's absolutely no way of discerning whatsoever that he'd be able to make the jump from uh, a Portuguese league to. 
uh, the best league in the world, you know. And um, I don't let Marco Silva. I have no idea, to be honest. Like in terms, like I, 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 will, I will admit my ignorance where Marco Silva is concerned. Thomas Frank, at least, he, like he's doing it in the Premier League, and the things that he's doing with Brentford, you know, very, very impressive. And the one thing that you got to say, if we do, if we did manage to pinch him from Brentford, he he would probably bring some of Brentford's best and brightest with him. And you know, Ivan Tony, I'm sure in, in a Tottenham jersey would excite absolutely everybody, especially if we did lose Kane, which hopefully that's not going to happen. But if we did, Ivan Tony would uh, would put some some smiles on some faces. It'd be a little bit of of comfort. So um, there may be you know an opportunity there. But at the, at the same time, if you're talking about which you know which is the the exciting appointment, look, I love a narrative. You know, I'm a filmmaker. I'm a storyteller. I love a narrative. And for me, there is no bigger uh, dream signing for a manager if we are going to lose Conte than Poch. I don't. I, I just can't see anybody trumping him in 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 that regard. Thomas Frank, I think of the three of them, is the is the safer bet. Let's be fair, because again, he's doing it in the Premier League. And you know, Brentford. The one thing I've been saying about Brentford all season is they are giant killers. You mm -hmm. know, like they are able to do incredible things against all the big teams. And to see to see that level of you know absolutely demolish demolishing the big boys, it's it's so impressive. So there's of of all of the ones that we've mentioned, Tom. I think Thomas Frank is the one that you would kind of go. There may be something there, you know, if he's able to work that kind of magic at Spurs, where, it's, you know, he's taken a, a Brentford team and he's taken down Giants like it's David versus Goliath every single Saturday, Sunday. If he's able to take a Spurs team, which clearly have more talent, let's be fair, in spite of the dross we have in defense, we have incredible players in the team all the same. And even, and, and I'm really, really excited to see Destiny Udo Udoji coming in after the summer. If he can take a Spurs team, and and turn them into an even more prolific David, like D D David with not just a sling, but like a bow and arrow and and full breastplate and armor. I mean, you know, there's there's uh, there's something to be said for that. I think in terms in terms of 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 the, the the managers that we've mentioned there. But again, I love a narrative, and I think for me, it would it would still be Pochettino all the way. For me, when I look at someone like Marco Silva, Thomas Frank, Rubo, Ruben Almarim, Roberto De Zerbi. I think their managers, I don't think they'll have too much influence, too much say at, at a club like Tottenham Hotspur, as big as Tottenham Hotspur is, in terms of recruitment and stuff like that. I think they'll more or less be given players and told to work with them, whereas someone like Thomas Tuchel, Luis Enrique and Pochettino, even though I knew no, it was different first time around, he's not as naive or he's not on the rise as he once was. He's sort of an established manager. I believe they'd have a lot more say in sort of the transfer window and stuff like that. But look, that's a debate we have um, it, our question we have in tomorrow's debate show, it's sort of like, do you want Spurs to keep going down the route of bringing in sort of like, um, what's the right word, legacy managers like a Jose, like a Conte, people like that? Or do you want to rip up the script and start again, start from scratch, willing to sit there three, four, five years of mediocrity and sort of see if something comes together, which is a big gamble? Um, so, you know, keep that in mind for tomorrow's uh, debate, people, and let us know your answers. For me, I would much rather us keep sort of dining at the top table of managers because I believe, you know, I, I, my personal belief is I don't think we're too far away. I think you bring in a new number one, you know, he's more up to speed with the modern game, you know, he's, he's more more sort of younger, fresher, more springing his step than maybe someone like Hugo Lloris who can distribute with his feet and also bring in, you know, I think we need to get another left wing back in this summer. I think two centre-backs and maybe a cam. I think an elite level manager, a legacy manager, are the ones that would definitely ultimately end up bringing success to Tottenham rather than someone like a Marco Silva, a Thomas Frank, a Ruben and Almerin. Because when I look at them appointments, I look and I go, OK, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be looking for another manager in two years. When I look at someone like Thomas Tuchel, Pochettino, although it hasn't been the case the last few years, I look at it and say... Yeah, you could see a five-year plan here or something like that. But again, it, it, it all sort of comes back to backing. You know, every manager is going to need backing at Tottenham, no matter who walks in the door. Uh, a couple of uh, super chats here. We've got one from Jerome. He says, in all honesty, if zero winners like Jose Conte fail the Spurs, how are Spurs going to attract Luis Enrique or even Tuchel? And this is uh, what many people worry was. This is what my worry was, uh, Adam when everyone was saying to sack Jose Mourinho, get rid of Jose Mourinho, I mean, everyone was putting out names like that skinny jean merchant um, who's now manager of Bayern Munich, you know, and they were putting out names like Conte, 
you know, to replace straight after Jose Mourinho. I told people it's not going to happen. You know, most of my top managers are going to look and see what Tottenham have done to someone like Jose Mourinho, the reputation he carries in the game, and go, uh uh, I have put my career on the line there. Then, you know, we ended up bringing in Nuno, but we were looking to get Conte because he was out of work. It's not like we attracted someone that was, you know, doing a top job somewhere else and he wanted to leave there to come to Tottenham. That wasn't the case. He was out of work and looking for a job. And I agree with someone like Jerome here. I, I, I fear you're not going to be able to get a, a Luis Enrique at Thomas Tuchel. I think it'll be an underwhelming appointment. I think it will be someone like an Al Maria, a Thomas Frank, someone like that. I don't think there's anyone that we can't attract, to be honest. I would, I would be more of the optimistic point of view in the sense that, like, the Conte, came, to Conte was out of work, yes, but Conte wouldn't have gone to Brentford if Brentford hadn't a manager. Conte wouldn't have gone to, uh, I doubt Conte would, would have gone to a, a West Ham or, or you know, I don't. I, there are very, I think there are very few teams that he would have gone. I can work with this. I think the reason that he he came to Spurs is because of the superstars that we had in the likes of of, of Harry Kane and Hungan Son. Um, and I think he he was hoping that he could depend an awful lot more on Hugo Lloris, a World Cup winner, um, than he's been able to. So he's looking at those players. But he was also, as he said many, many times, he's looking at a world-class stadium. He's looking at a world-class training centre. And he's thinking to himself, I, there's something here that I can turn uh, I can turn dirt, decent players into elite players and I can turn world-class players into legends. And I think that that's what he saw looking at the... Looking at, um, uh, what Tottenham had available and I think that also he's thinking he was probably thinking to himself well and I think is very true the purse strings can, uh, can be and have been loosened that little bit more as a result of the fact that the reason that that Levy was so tight in the first place is because we were building the stadium we were we were doing serious things in terms of the infrastructure with that money that's done now and not only that but the but because we have that infrastructure in place and because we have the extracurricular things going on with respect to concerts and and whatnot and now this new formula one stuff it means that there is more money there and i think that that people are going to see that in the transfer windows coming we are going to spend more money than people assume and so you when you when you look at any any other elite manager or mid mid-tier like a b-tier manager or whatever they'll look at tottenham and go there's absolutely no reason why i can't go in and do and do something um especially if they know that the only reason conte is going is because he's homesick or because he is annoyed with the lack of patience from the fans excuse me no no you're all good you're all good I think that I I just think that that even when you go below that the other the other um, uh, managers they're not looking at it and, and thinking oh I'm going to sink my career by going there because Jose failed Conte failed I think they'll look at it and go this is a chance for me to prove myself because I I, I get to jump to an even higher level do you know what I mean the likes of Thomas Frank. He's not going to look at it and go, oh, I can't go to go to there. It's a poison chalice. He's going to think, OK, I can go to Spurs and make a name for myself because I will be like, all eyes will be on me. But there's a difference in the CV of someone like Thomas Frank and Antonio Conte and Jose Mourinho. For sure. Right? For sure. But at any level, I think they've all got reasons to want to come to Spurs. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I fully understand you. I think, look, when you look at Tottenham's managerial appointments over the last while, someone like Pochettino, who came from Southampton, who were maybe similar to what Brentford are now, has, has worked out at Tottenham. But you know, I, I just fear that if we do sack Antonio Conte, what top level manager are we going to get in here next? I don't disagree with you that we're an attractive proposition, but when you look at the two last big managers that we signed with big CVs with trophies on their CVs. Jose Mourinho, out of work recently, sacked by Man United. Antonio Conte, out of work recently, you know, sacked by Inter Milan. And it's kind of like, if them guys were in jobs and we went to approach them, would we get them? No. And that's why I fear the next manager appointment for me is going to be underwhelming. You know, you look at what we do in the transfer market. Many people say it's underwhelming. We want big name signings. It's never going to happen with someone like a Thomas Frank and Almer and uh, uh, Marco Silva. So for me... The tra tra trajectory I'm on and where I see success is I want to stay in that sort of elite elite manager bracket. But big up, Jerome. Hopefully that answers your question, my man. And uh, really appreciate the support. Good question, Jerome. Good question, my man. And he also says, just a question, are we Spurs fans so staffed for a trophy the last 15 years that we are not willing to give any manager time? I think you're absolutely spot on with that. And for me, look, I don't blame the Spurs fans as impatient. You know, some of the stuff we have to endure 
is is a piss take at times. You know, some of the weights in the transfer windows that we've had to do, some of the signings that we've made in in on, under Steve Hitch and Rini on the Wellman positions. Um, you know, the constant wait for a trophy, the constant near misses uh, under Pochettino when you're looking at a grant to build in the stadium. But if you push the ball out one or two more sort of players, you, you'd probably end up winning something. And I think Spurs fans are very, very right, winning the right to be frustrated. And and not and and I understand why everyone's patience is gone, to be honest with you. I mean, it's too long when you're looking at Leicester City come from nowhere to win a Premier League, you know, win an FA Cup, teams like that. It really does, you know, add to it as well, my man. When you're seeing, you know, Arsenal sort of go post Wenger era, new stadium, the difficulties that that brought, now they're coming out of it, they're sitting top of the league and stuff. It only amplifies it and adds to it. But, you know, we we at some stage, if you want what a Liverpool have built on the Jurgen Klopp, where they went on to win every cup in club football, if you want what Man City have built under Guardiola, you know, okay, that's probably maybe a bit more extravagant because they can just go and spend 150 million on wing backs. But the point is, Guardiola didn't win anything the first season. They still stuck with him and invested more. Jurgen Klopp it didn't go well at times. Remember, they lost to West Brom 2 1, and they were doing all that to the fans, and they were getting slated this, that, and the other. But they stuck with him, kept on investing. You look at Arsenal with Arteta, they had the whole team with Abumi, and most of the fans wanted him out last year. They stuck with him, continued to invest, and look at the fruits of it. And if we want that, we have to go with it. The era of Abramovich coming in, being able to sack managers every year and still go on and win trophies, that's finished with. In football, if you want success, it's going back to the way it was under someone like Fergie. You know, people like that, where you've got to stick with them. You've got to build something. You've got to build a culture in and around the club as well. And I, I honestly genuinely believe that comes with maybe the mentalities of footballers changing, where they're more in it now for the money rather than the football side of things. So, like, what, over years gone by, you would say some of them are more born to win, want to win. So you could get away with being ruthless and bringing in different managers because you've got winners at your football club. But at Tottenham, we don't have that. So we have to develop and build that sort of culture. And the only way you're going to do that is under someone that knows how to do it, my man. And I get... You know, we can sit here and pin everything on an Antonio Conte like we've done on Jose Mourinho. But we're now sitting here today and looking back at Jose Mourinho's words and some of the stuff from the documentary. And you're like, he got it right. You know, and we can't keep looking back two, three years later going, oh, shit, he got it right. He got it right. He got it right. We have to wake up to the flaws. We have to sit there and analyze it, weigh it up. You know, if we did improve the back line and goalkeeper on Antonio Conte, can we go and win something? You look at his last couple of seasons, two, four place so far this year, still in top four. Last season dragged us to top four out of nowhere. You know, despite the fence being a major issue in both, in both seasons, you know. So for me, I think if you continue to invest in that, I do think you will see the, the rewards in it. I'm just not sure the board have the patience. So I'm not sure the fans have the patience for it anymore and that's that's what my concern is but my other concern is as well I don't want to end up someone like Watford where they bring in a manager it's not work out sack him get a new manager in for a manager bounce and look to just survive because let's be honest with Harry without Harry Kane this season we would exactly be fighting relegation with the way we've been playing um take his goals out of the team with the lack of goals elsewhere you know with, with how much we can see that's exactly where we'd be you know, and Harry Kane's not getting any younger either. You know, he's re he's coming up to 30. He's got a 15, 16 months left on his contract. So it went, if, 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 even if Harry Kane does see out that contract, that 16 months, when he goes, is that what our future looks like? Well, in order to prevent that, with Son, Hugo, Kane, people have been around years all sort of coming to the end. Now's the time to bring in a guy or continue to back a guy and let him develop a culture so that when these guys go, it's not a huge loss. You already have a development plan in place. What you can't do is hire and fire managers, waste these guys' career, and then when they go, you're absolutely stuck there. That cannot be allowed to happen. Anything you want to say on that, Adam? Very passionately, by the way. I apologise. No, 100%. That was a great a great rant. A great uh, uh, Dave Harris rant there. But uh, <laughs> let me let me, uh, let me me kind of change perspective a little bit and see and see are, are, we, are we missing something? Because we're, like, we're all focused on, 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 on the future and as we should be, but we're all kind of looking at, okay, Conte, Conte's in the rear, rear view mirror. What, what, what will we do? Can we, do we have to change the philosophy? Do we have to change this, that, the other? We're all immediately going into the negative thinking. We have to start something from the ground up. And there's so much of that conversation going on. Tottenham need to rebuild from the ground up, from the ground up, from the ground up. And I'm, I'm, I'm to a certain extent I'm baffled by that narrative because the fact is I think that we are 
insanely close to being able to pull off a uh, the the um, the run for silverware that we're looking for. We're so so close to that because we have the elite level manager. We have the the we finally have the infrastructure. We have the there's there is money there to be able to go and secure the players that we need this summer to be able to go and do better than we did this this season. I believe that this season the reason that we choked in terms of getting any silverware at all is because of the prior prioritization of the, the the top four in the Premier League and to get as far into the Champions League as possible. Now, did we wet the bed where the Champions League is concerned? Absolutely, of course we did. That was that was really really poor. Uh, although I don't think it was the worst display against AC Milan in, in, in uh, at home, to be honest, I, I I I know I'll have some critics where that's concerned, but I don't think it was as poor a performance as people were making it out to be. That wow. said, we prioritised the Champions League, we prioritised the Premier League. Conte made that very clear in one of his interviews as well, and therefore we let the FA Cup and the Carabao Cup slip through our fingers. But I, we have we had the team that could have gone further. Next season, we'll have a team that can absolutely take care of anything. And I truly, truly believe that. We are this close. This is not the time to, to go, okay, let's let's get rid of Conte. If he walks, he walks. Fair enough. Mm. If, if everyone believes the media and the media are correct, which I never seem to find is actually true. Uh, you know, we, we've had the conversations recently as well about that when he was at Inter Milan, everyone was absolutely sure he was going to go at one stage and then he stayed on and signed on for the next season and, and he was still there. Conte's given us no actual verbal indication that he wants to leave Spurs. He's only ever told us that the fans are, 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 um, are have lost their patience. We are this close already uh, genuinely this close to having a season next year that could be could absolutely change everything and i and i don't think pe- like i think people are so close minded to that i think people are like okay no we have to re- start from the ground up let's do it now probably because our noisy neighbors down the road had a plan and did that strategy and now it's working for them but we are this close to having an unbelievable side you get two new center backs and a goalkeeper and Destiny Udoji comes into play on the left-hand side of the pitch. Suddenly, all, we've got an amazing selection suddenly of, of right wing backs to choose from. Right, the rest of our players are, 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 are perfectly capable of doing the business. Next season, with three, with just three purchases, and suddenly we could be an entirely different squad that's going and demolishing things. Mm. Once we have solidity at the back, we will be able to play more offensive football. We will yeah. have the ability to, to rely on a stronger defence so that the likes of Hungman Son, who's been handicapped this season, fair enough, he may be out of out of form as well, but he's mm. also been handicapped by the fact that we are playing this keep 11 behind the ball and he's not sprinting ahead and allowed to do his own thing going forward on his own. And he's been handicapped by Perisic, who I hope is not even in the club next season. He's been that bad. He's been handicapped by Perisic being in his position on the left hand side if we're playing with son doing what he needs to do darting forward because we've got more we don't we don't need to have all 11 players behind the ball because our defense is so shite if we yeah. have a more optimistic and and pressing strategy because our defense is decent because we have the brand new keeper and the brand new center backs we can do i i I'm, i like i know i sound delusionally optimistic but we are this close to a team that can do incredible, incredible things. <coughs> and I just, I wish that people would do, would have that. Give it one more, one more season for crying out loud. It's the same, you know. I, 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 I can't understand the people. I can't understand the people who are like sell Hung Min Son. It's like because because he's had one bad season after after being getting better and better and better and better for the last seven, and he's become one of the best players, you know, in, in his position in the world. He has one bad season, and now it's time to sell him. There's such negativity, seriously, in this community, and I'm just like, guys, let's just give it one more push with Conte. Honestly, just give it one more season. If it doesn't work out, then fine. But for crying out loud, let's get the let's get an entire first team squad of absolutely incredible players and let Conte do his thing. For crying out loud, let's let it happen. Well Adam Liz here, yeah, aka Nick, aka the Maestro, big up my man. Hopefully you're keeping well and you and on you got home safe. Yesterday he says Adam, your perspective as always is a breath of fresh air. So big up, Nick. Absolutely love that. Anything you want to say to Nick Adam before I give you Adam Phillips' comments here? Where he's no, so 
he doesn't have Nick's take. <laughs> <laughs> no, Nick, I appreciate that. Thanks so much. I'm glad that there are some people in the community that have that optimism and or or at least want to hear the optimistic take because I know an awful lot of people are just thinking Adam is such a delusional guy, and I'm like, I, I'm I, I I it's it. There's always rationale behind what I'm thinking. It. I'm not an, I'm not an emotional person. I'm honestly everything that that I've got going on is all up here. It's not in here. So I believe it from from the bottom of my brain, not the bottom of my heart. It's it's, it's doable, and I hope that you keep the, the hope alive, my friend. Big up, Nick. And then you've got Adam Phillip, different end of the spectrum. He says, how are we this close? Miles off, no closer than any other manager. Miles off what? We like we okay. We 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 we. I I said exactly why we got dumped out of the FA Cup and the Carabao Cup because we didn't prioritize them, right? We like Champions League was we just we, all we were trying to do was get as deep as we possibly can. No one ever thought that we were going to win the Champions League this season anyway. And at the moment, we're in the top four, which we weren't last season, and we finished top four last season, even though we were already miles behind. So if we're fourth now. We can either stay there or we could end up toppling Manchester United and end up in third place, which is entirely doable because all we have is one game a week for the rest of the season, a much, much easier rest of the season than most of the other teams at the top of the table. Mm. So there's no reason to believe that we can't even get third, never mind fourth. That is progress. And then we have our summer transfer window. There you are, Adam. Now, Adam, Philip, let me know if you agree or disagree. Look, at me, I've said this a number of times. I think you address that back line, that goalkeeper. I think you will see a much better product from Tottenham, even under Antonio Conte. I think you'll start to see us maybe, you know, dominate possession a little bit because, you know, whether, you, whether you're playing Conte's way or whether you're playing, you know, Pochettino's way, it relies on players out passing out from the back and being able to do it consistently enough, but also draw pressure onto him, which creates room further up the pitch. You have to have players that are able to do that. We have to get back to the levels of Toby and Jan sort of in possession. And until we do that, I, th I think um, I think you're going to struggle to see any sort of Tottenham side sort of dominate or keep possession because whether we like it or not, defenders in the modern day game, they have their part to play and it's a crucial part in that. Even if you want to keep teams boxed in, you have to, you, your, your defenders have to be comfortable with the ball on the halfway line as well. But also, you know, they have to be comfortable to defend, you know, so which allows your team to press higher up the pitch. We've seen time and time again this season, we can't do that. We drop off. We allow players to, you know, get, get the ball on the ball on the halfway line and get to the edge of our box and car one in. We've seen that time and time again this season. So I do agree that I do think if you sign if you sign a lot better defenders than what we've currently got, I do think you'd see a massive improvement on the pitch, and I think you'd you'd also give Conte a fair crack next season to see what we can do. Now, look, don't get me wrong. I think then you know other teams start asking different answers of you of what like they asked us at the back end of last season, Brighton, Brentford. You know, block up the middle, ask Tottenham to go out wide, ask them to use their weight. How good are your fullbacks? Can they take players on? Can they deliver the ball? I think last year, OK, we didn't have the answers. I think with Porro, I think you've got one answer there. And let's see what Adoji can do on the left side when he comes in. You might have them answers. So, look, I don't, I don't want to rip up the script and have to sit there, wait for four or five years of mediocrity because, do you know what? It's a huge gamble and it might not pay off. And if it doesn't pay off, with the finances involved in football nowadays, would we ever be able to claw that back? I'm not so sure, you know. So, for me, I think when I look at it, it's, you know, keep content for another two years and I'd rather give that a chance than sit there and give someone four or five years to sort of clear the decks and go his own way. Because for me, I think it's a huge gamble. I'm not sure it's one that will pay off. I can understand, you know, people's criticisms of content, the style of play, etc., etc. But like I said, I think that genuinely improve if you're not conceding as many goals as we are. I think I, I'll tell you now how many we've conceded. I've actually calculated it up today. Um, I think we've conceded 37 in 27 or in 27 in the Premier League. Just give me one second. I'll tell you what the others we've conceded. So we've conceded 37 in 27 in the Premier League, um, despite scoring 49. Um, in in uh, how many games have we conceded two or more goals? 16 times this season we've conceded two or more goals. And that can't continue to happen under any manager. And I think that is a huge part on why you see us conceding the goals we do, why you see us relinquishing possession because when you're constantly going behind it changes the momentum of the game or your your opponents sniff danger sniff sniff a kill so they go harder at it you know full throttle and our players can't stand up to that mentality wise so i would agree with you adam i don't think we're too far off but you know it remains to be seen whether the board will stump up the right amount of money to get in defenders because 
Look, I've no doubt the reason why they've refused to do it so far is because when you're looking at top centre half nowadays, you're probably talking 80 to 100 million. You know, if you want the elite centre half, which is, for me, I think is what you should be aiming to get. And, you know, we need two or three of them. So if you're Daniel Levy, it's cheaper and easier to go and employ the best defensive managers in world football. You know, and we've had three of them and they still won't equate to what one top centre half is rather than actually go and spend that money on what we need to be able to take us to success. Uh, James uh, Coffey says, if Conte can't manage more than one game a week, then why bother when qualifying for, uh, with qualifying for the Champions League? What would you say to this, Adam? Because there is that stat that goes around where, you know, points and, and, and results and everything and performances sort of drop off when, you know, Conte's team are asked to play two games a week. We're only at the point at the season now where we only have one game a se- one game a week. All the way up until this point, we've had two games, right? So, and, and we're fourth in the league. So the only the only concern this season was that we prioritised getting to top four and we prioritised getting deep into the Champions League over the two cups that were actually winnable. That's the only problem I have, and that was probably a board decision as much as it was a Conte decision anyway. There's probably everybody on the same side where that's concerned. So I don't think that this, it's, a, it's a case of Conte not being able to play two matches uh, a, a week because we, we're, we are where we're at now because Conte is probably capable of getting the team to play two matches a week. The difference will be that when we have the extra players to be able to rotate an awful lot more when we have the option of of having we have so many central midfielders now that are perfectly capable of doing good things right skip's only getting better and better sire's only getting better and better we know how good benton core and hoybeer are so we've got no concerns in the central midfield we have an incredible front line there's no point in even, in even going into that then we will have an, an option of rotating on the on the flanks you've got romero and paro on, on on one side depending on whether you want to go defensively or, or defensive or offensive on the left hand side you'll have Yudoji and hopefully ben davis i actually think ben davis is not a bad wing back he's a terrible center back but as a wing back and an understudy to Yudoji, if we if we need to rest Yudoji, if we need someone to be a little bit more defensive than offensive Devin Davis is not a bad show just just for next season until we can replace him as well. So then it's just the centre backs are the, are the, and, and the goalkeeper are the only problem. We will have players to be able to rotate in every position. And it's the it, am I the only person listening to Conte? He said you need two solid players in every position, right? And you will have your two solid players in every position once we once we get another at least at least one potentially two transfer windows in, right? And we know we've been doing good stuff in January windows lately. So every window is an opportunity. And if, when we're able to actually rotate so that we can keep good a good team on the pitch, irrespective of who we're resting, then you'll be able to see us do incredible things in all competitions at the same time. But this season, it was just a case of sacrificing the two lesser competitions to get as deep as we can into the more um the more the higher priority competitions it's not that Conte is not able to play two games a week because he has played two games a week all the way till now and we're we sit fourth in the league I think look for me I do think and I think it actually predates Conte I think when Tottenham have been asked to sort of play two games a week if it's not your best 11 out there every week which sort of you know is hardly ever because of injuries, suspensions. You know they've got that red zone now. That uh, if the players are in the red zone, they tend to take them out with a starting lineup. Um, for me, I think it's inevitable that you're going to see a drop off, and I think it's always been the case at Tottenham purely because some of the players are asking to come in just don't give a shit about football or Tottenham Hotspur, in my opinion. And I know Adam's a bit different on this, but I include Ben Davies in that. You know, he's been a part of a lot of the FA Cup exits, League Cup exits. He was a part of, you know, the Royal Conference Team League um, and how, catastro- how, how catas- catas- catastrophic that was. Um, so for me, you know, I think, you're, James, you're always going to see that sort of drop off. I think the only way you're not going to see that or you have a chance of maybe not seeing that is when you, you bring in better players. and You just accept the answers that these players have given you time and time again. And not us fans. I mean, the owners. I mean, us fans know about these guys. We hate seeing them. You know, Davis and Sanchez with Boone coming on against Milan. You know, the guy can't stay on his feet. Eric Dyer, you know, someone give him a role in Lion King or the West End because he's not a centre-back. And Ben Davies, you know, as much as he tries, the guy's just not good enough. Um, and look, it's not only them, it's other players. Lucas Moore down the years, OK, thanks for that. But, you know, when he stepped in these games, not good enough and people yeah. like that. So I think that's why you see a massive drop-off, James. You know, again, it comes down to squad, squad depth for me, my man. 
But, you know, this is something that was at his time at Inter as well, where, you know, with true European football in the mix, two games a week, there was a slight drop-off. So, look, it's understandable, James. It's it's understandable. I do see where you're coming from, my man. Uh, but for me, at Tottenham Hotspur, it's not helped. You know, you look at Jose Mourinho, same thing. Problems when he had to rotate or when he had to use them guys. Nuno, Pochettino, and the, the, you know, the season he got sacked when he had start relying on some of these guys. I mean, it's not a new to me, and I don't think we'll ever have a chance at Tottenham until some of these losers are gone, and that's what they are. You know, Sanchez had a chance to go in January to go and play first-team football. You think, as a footballer, that's the first thing on his priority list. No, sorry. Um, it, it was 10th on his list. First priority on his list was keeping his major at Tottenham Hotspur because he knows going to France, he's, he's not going to get paid as much. You know, and that, that's the problem we have. But then, you know, he gets rewarded by giving the captain's armband in the FA Cup. Well, I mean, look, that's on Conte, which I think is stupid. You know, you could have given it to Sun that day. But, you know, just what's going on? What's going on with these guys? It really winds me up. But big up, James, my man. Really appreciate the support, everyone. Uh, if you could keep smashing that like button, keep smashing that subscribe button. And also feel free to keep getting your comments in the chat and engage with us. Why not make it a super chat? Really helps everything we're trying to do here. Um, you know, we do watch longs, pre-match build-ups, fan shows after games, fan shows, um, you know, after the weekend and before games. We do debate shows and everything else like that. So it just helps keep us going. So big up, James. Really appreciate that, my man. So let's see where we're at next. So we've talked re really about sort of a lot of the managers. So where are we at? About sacking Conte, um, Sammy Mott Bell, Daily Mail, aka Sky Sports as well, I believe. Tier 1, the bill for sacking Conte would not exceed £5 million. That's because he's only got a few months left on his contract. But look, I, I think I've more or less covered it. I don't think, you know, sacking Conte is the right answer unless it's for, you know, someone that is known for success and playing it on, on a, a more of a front foot way. But uh, so for me, I think I know where I'm at with Antonio Conte. Adam, I'm pretty sure I know where you were at. But anything you want to say on this quickly? Yeah, I think we covered an awful lot, Dave, in the last conversation, the last topic. But well, I'll just finish uh, uh, the the idea of of like the idea of losing Conte is crazy when you think about the 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 if we get to the end of this season and we are higher in a position or we're in the same position but we have more points then i think it's crazy to 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 think that we shouldn't keep him get get in the new center backs and and uh, and a goalkeeper that we need and he will do incredible things last season we finished with 71 points if we end up with the high 70s or dare i say an 80 points uh, this season, then people who want to see Conte gone with that level of a jump in points by the time the the, the season finishes, it's it, it's just crazy. We shouldn't we shouldn't be wanting Conte out whatsoever. Look, it costs us a lot more to sack Pochettino, Jose Mourinho, and Nuno. With it being so little, if 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 the players are fed up as the press you know says they are, if some of the board are split on them and fed up with them the way they are, with some of the pressure he's actually brought to the owners and Daniel Levy, which I sort of agree with, and I think you know someone like him has the power to do. Why haven't they sacked him already if he's causing them such problems, Adam? Considering it's the less the lowest fee they've had to pay any manager in years. Then the answer for me is don't trust the media. I don't listen to a single word of it. I think it's insane. It's it it really. I do you know what? Like I'm I'm one of the things that I will say is there's an like I I do have a very uh a kind of I've, I have alarm bells for 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 anything that I see as being conspiratorial. I really think that the media just want to see Tottenham burn. I think the media yeah. love yeah. talking about about how Tottenham are Spursy. They love that narrative. And I think that they want to see Tottenham burn. And I think that they they create these stories. They they talk about this and that in order to get Tottenham fan, fans angry. And then the Tottenham fans end up putting the board in a position to make decisions that the board wouldn't make otherwise. And I think that that the board don't want to sack Conte. And I don't think Conte has any decision. He, Conte hasn't signed a contract because he wants to see where we finish and he wants to see uh, what the the the. The board are willing to do in terms of backing him during the summer and he's perfectly entitled to do that he's in a very strong position to be able to go do you know what i'm not going to sign until i'm sure that i'm going to continue to get backed and he's that's his that's his prerogative but nothing about what he's saying in the, from his own mouth indicates that he wants to leave tottenham and he's saying that the fans are the ones that are, are, are losing patience the fans are losing patience because they're listening to the media everyone stop looking at the articles on your phone stop 
watching Sky Sports and BBC and listening to the dross, the absolute drivel that comes out of their mouths. Listen to the man himself, back the man while we still have an incredible opportunity going into next season. And it's still an incredible opportunity to finish in a Champions League position this year and then see what he can do. There is no reason not to give him the time that he has asked for. Interesting, interesting. Look, I definitely believe, you know, that every I've said this time and time again, I think all the other Premier League clubs, the media, I think everybody over there is absolutely anti Tottenham for sure. And it's like they always want to belittle them and beat them where they can. Um, look, for me, I think it's interesting um, that, you know, considering it's only five million and they haven't sat Conte, because most of the Conte out argument would be that. Instead of prolonging this out to the end of the season, why not get in the new guy and start letting him see what he can and can't work with and then have a good summer under him and go next season, which I definitely understand. So it'd be interesting. I wonder, has this situation purposely been allowed to manifest to see what players sort of have that winning mentality, who would continue to do um, their job regardless of the manager's future? be very, very interesting to see what happens there. But look, for me, I'll, I'll be honest, I do think he probably won't sign. And I think you'll see him managing the club in Italy next season. Although for me, I would like to keep him. And then we've got David Ornstein from The Athletic. He says, um, those close to the situation say a THFC return from Richard Pochettino is unlikely and will be an uphill task if he were to be appointed. Now, just quickly on this, I think we did go into good depth on Mauricio Pochettino already. And for me, I've said this already. I think if we do bring back Pochettino, I think I think Daniel Levy's job should be uh, scrutinised, and I think he should be sacked. To be honest with you, because it means everything we've done over the last three to four years with Jose Mourinho, Conte, and Nuno, they've been massive, expensive mistakes in the transfer market. With also hiring and firing them, and the wages they accumulated with being here. Whereas we could have just done it under Pochettino and we wouldn't have to take them three or four years of a hit that we've already took. So for me, I think if that was in any other job or in any other walk of life or even in any other sport, I think the owners would be looking at him and saying, get him gone. Um, in my opinion, I think they would be looking at Sackland. So I do think if Pochettino comes back or if, he, if he's even considered to come back, I do believe Daniel Levy's head should roll in that position. I think it's unforgivable than what he's put the fans through for the last three or four years. But Adam, plenty of Spurs fans believe that Pochettino is very eager to get a second crack at a job. If this is to be true, this uh, could be an uphill task to sign him. Is that because Daniel Levy's reluctant to sign uh, to sign him up? Or is it because Pochettino could be reluctant to sign, in your opinion? Again, I, I am... I, I I have to reiterate that I think you've got to you've got to listen to what comes out of a man's mouth and assume that he is telling you the truth. The P Poch has made it clear he has un unfinished business at Tottenham and he would love to return to Tottenham. He could have gone for a different job. He could have gone for the Chelsea job and he turned it down. He had no interest because his heart is with Tottenham. I have no doubt in my mind that if we wanted him back, he would come back in a heartbeat. He has said as much. And I think you do have to believe what comes out of his mouth. As far as the club not wanting him coming back is concerned, again, it's all hearsay and speculation in the media. We've, we've got, we've got, there's no, there's nothing to back that up because we haven't heard it from Levy. We haven't heard it from anyone on the board. We haven't heard it from Paratici either. So because we have, we've got absolutely no one to, 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 to listen to on that apart from the media, I say, ignore it. Poch will come back if we want him. And so the only, the only question is, do we, would we rather keep Conte or would we rather have the, the fantasy story, but a bit of a punt with Poch? I think Poch will wait another year. Poch will happily wait another year if if Conte wants to wants to take one more crack with us next season, and I think that that would be an incredible story as well. If 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 if, if Conte decides what he wants to do is win trophies with Tottenham, so he can show how amazing he is, because Jose Mourinho couldn't even win a trophy with Tottenham, but Poch, but that, but Conte does. That would be an incredible story for him. And if he sticks around next season, wins a trophy, and then sails off into the sunset, and Poch comes in, that's the best story ever. That's just the most incredible possible outcome. And so mm -hmm. I, I I say uh, ignore the people saying that Poch doesn't want to come because he definitely, definitely would. And I don't see any reason that the like there's no reason to believe that the board are not interested. So we'll just we'll see what happens when it happens because we've got absolutely we're not in the boardroom and we can't we can't, you know, we don't know what their minds are are up to. Um, but I think Poch 
is certainly from most people's perspective is the you know is the dream signing and i think that that uh levy is most likely if he if he brings potch back i'm not on the train of of beat him over the head with his mistake i think if he decides to bring back a high, hmm? it's an admittance of guilt it's you yeah. know how much money wasted in transfer fees how much money wasted in manager fees etc yeah. it's an expensive mistake to make I agree. Tottenham, where you have to sort of make best use of your money every single season. Yeah, I agree. But I also like as a consistent Christian man myself, I think, you know, if he, <laughs> if, he if he admits if he admits his faults, forgiveness is offered. Forgiveness is given completely and utterly freely. If he thinks that he did something wrong and he brings back the king, then let him bring back the king and all is forgiven. The uh, interesting people, let me know where you're at. If if Potch is signed up, you know, um <clears throat> should should leave his head roll for 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 what's allowed to sort of manifest over the last three or four years, or are you with Adam? You know, but if he brings back the king, as he calls him, Pochettino, do you give Levy a reprieve? Let me know in the comments, please. Um, interesting discussion there. Um, who else have we got? What else have we got here? Adam, uh, Harry Kane's future. Alistair Gold, tier one, he says, Harry Kane's future is not linked with that of Antonio Conte. Now, Adam, plenty of us believe that his future was linked with Conte because um, Harry Kane will stay if he sees Spurs are heading in the right direction. Someone like me, you know, is it possible that Kane is willing to give another top quality manager a try like uh, some of the ones on the shortlist? Because, you know, you see everything out there in the media and the pressure put on by pundits. You know, Harry Kane needs to leave Tottenham to, to go and win trophies for him to be taken seriously, for his legacy to sort of be taken seriously. Where are you at with the whole situation but also you see a lot of stuff coming out today that Tottenham want Harry Kane to be the face of the new project and um, you know he they, they want to give him a say in sort of or he's having his say with the board in terms of managerial appointments you know what sort of tactics to go with going in the future players coming in the door players out etc etc and should a player although how good Harry Kane is should a player be allowed that sort of influence at football club in, 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 in kind of sort of contrast to what I was saying before about the media, I think Alistair Gold is one of the people that I feel like I, if I'm going to trust somebody, I would trust him an awful lot more than most. Doesn't mean that I would put all the eggs in one basket. Doesn't mean that I don't take what he says with a little pinch of salt because he, at the end of the day, he's still journalism. And, you know, I think journalism today is absolutely disgraceful. However, Alistair Gold, I think, has, enough, has, has a, a serious amount of my respect. And if he says that Harry Kane's uh, future is not tied to Conte, that gives me more. I know I'm the hopeful guy, but it gives me more hope because I do think that Alistair Gold is someone that we can trust up to a very, very large degree. And I, if he says that, if he says that, then then I think that that's fantastic. I also think there's plenty of reasons to believe that uh, Harry Kane's future is isn't uh, uh, linked with um, Conte for the fact that he still has another um a year left on the contract and i don't think that levy's going to want to let go of him anytime soon i think conte is def or, sorry kane is definitely going to want to stay in the premier league because he's going to he's going to want to keep smashing individual records if he's never going to go on and win a trophy <laughs> with with the team he's going to want to win every single individual trophy imaginable and becoming the premier league's number one top goal scorer is something that will take a very very long time to uh, to overcome um, and I think that that's something that he'd be interested in doing. And he can do that with Tottenham. Now, one of the things that people have been considering is whether or not a sort of Kylian Mbappe situation may happen, where he'll be sort of given the keys to the kingdom, as it were. And maybe you might see if Harry is, is told that he can have a very uh, high degree of influence in terms of everything club related going forward, as long as he stays, that might be something that interests him. He, if he's able to decide uh, to a large degree who the next manager is, if he's able to decide um, to a certain extent who he wants to play next to and stuff like that, I mean, that is something that may um tickle him enough to make him want to stay and at the end of the day the other thing about that is if he stays with tottenham he will be a club hero he will be he will essentially be and i don't like using this word but he will essentially be a god to the uh to the spurs fandom for all eternity you know if he if he cements his loyalty and sticks with us so there's plenty of reasons for him to want to stay and the only team that i think could go in for him or would want to go in for him at this stage um but you know before it's kind of really too late to go in for someone of his age is manchester united but we're already seeing that there's a potentiality that they're going to go for uh, uh somebody else um 
who has uh, yes less years in their legs, more time uh, to play to play at, the, at a high level for them going forward. That they're too used to spending big money on bringing like the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo back and bringing in uh, Ibrahimovic and stuff like that. Um, they need to bring in someone for the long haul, and I think they'll go for a younger player. I think that as much as Ten Hag seems to want. Uh, Kane, I don't think that they're, uh, you know, again, you've got to you've got to deal with Daniel Levy at the end of the day, and he's not going to make things easy whatsoever. So I think there's a very very strong possibility that even if Conte goes, Kane will still be with us not only next season but possibly. Uh, I think it's still a very high likelihood that he'll he'll be with us all the way until the end of his career. Well, rumours from the club today were also suggesting that, um, you know, even if he doesn't sign, Tottenham will not be selling. Which, look, for me, I think. When you look at this situation, I do think Harry Kane probably will sign, in my opinion. I think, look, Daniel Levy's not going to sell to any other English club. That's a fact. He's not going to let Harry Kane go. He didn't let Gareth Bale go to Man United when the opportunity was there. He didn't let Luka Modric go to Chelsea when that opportunity was there. And he also didn't let Harry Kane go to Man City when that opportunity was there. So he's not going to sell his best assets to a club in England. So right now, when you look at the rest of the club, that probably only leaves Bayern Munich because they're the only ones that have really been sort of touted or interested. Now, I've no doubt if if we do end up selling, or there is a hint that, you know, a club is close to getting a field. No doubt you'll see the likes of PSG, Real Madrid, people like them. I think you'll, see, think you, you'll probably see them interested in coming in. But, you know, I don't think it makes sense for Daniel Levy to sell, to be honest with you, because if you're Daniel Levy and you love the finances the way you do, with Harry Kane, Champions League qualification is probably out the window, which means you don't get that prize money. You probably won't get as many games shown on TV because Harry Kane's captain of England, Mr. England, you know, and people want to see him. He's sort of Tottenham's lure, Tottenham's draw. You know, he's their most exciting player. So if we lose him, you lose TV revenue. You'll also lose prize money from the Premier League, you know, going out earlier in cups than what we already even are. So I don't think it makes sense for someone like Daniel Levy to let Harry Kane go, even if he doesn't sign his new contract. But look, for me, if you're going to give Harry Kane a say on manager tactics, players in and out, you've got to give him that in a captain in a, in a capacity of captain. Because if not, it's only going to cause problems. It's going to cause frictions. It's also going to cause friction with if there's another club captain, that guy, because he'll feel like Harry Kane has more say, more power, which will then lead to splits in the camp, et cetera, et cetera. And we can't afford that. Um, so for me, I think you'd, you, you in, 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 when you're giving him a new contract, I'd like to see him maybe given the uh, captain's armband as well. I think if he's going to sign a new contract, then basically, you know, sign it up until he's 34, 35, and his best days are behind him. I think you've got to give him that chance of, of leading Tottenham. I think it'd be a crime to sort of let him see how his career without ever really making him club captain, letting him have a say, influence, you know, setting down the marker for new signers coming in, you know, setting down the, 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 the standards on what it takes to be a Tottenham Hotspur player. I openly think you would have to let Harry Kane be that guy. And yeah, it's going to take the massive money to be able to convince the guy to sign. You'd probably have to break their wage structure, which they don't like doing at Tottenham. But when you've got a world class like uh, a talent like Harry Kane, sort of there, there, there are exceptions to the rules. And for me, Harry Kane is one of them. And I think they should do everything in their power to be able to convince Harry Kane. If that means Harry Kane's up there saying, get rid of this guy or that guy, well, you've got to understand it comes from a place of a guy wanting to win trophies. He said it. His, his ultimate dream would be lift silverware at Tottenham. So whatever, where his decisions are coming from, they're not coming from a personal or a selfish sort of position. They're coming from a position that will aid him to win trophies, which he knows will aid his legacy and his reputation. So for me, I don't think it would be a bad idea for the club to make him captain and maybe listen to him a little. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think that it's beneficial. To, I'm seeing someone in the comments saying that Kane will rapidly fade away in a year or two, like Shearer. I don't think that's true at all. I think Kane is a, is a more complete player. Shearer was an out and out goal scorer. Kane is an incredible striker. But when he start, if he's, uh, you know, starts losing a bit of pace, um, he, there's no reason why he can't drift back into a number eight role and be spreading the ball about like Kevin De Bruyne. And I've been saying this for ages. He's not a number nine. He's a number 10 at the moment. So he, he should be in that more, uh, that deeper role where he's able to play the ball off to other players to get more goals as well as banging them in himself um i think that he's got he, kane uh, you know he's he made a point of saying that he will try and play until he's 40 years old and i don't see any reason why he can't because he's that good of a of a, of a ball player 
And I know, look, you, you know, Gary Neville's probably, you know, ringing Harry Kane as we speak to try and get a new uh, trip on the golf course with him and this, that and the other. But, you know, you, you see some people that say, look, it makes it makes sense for Harry Kane to leave. Yeah, yeah, it probably would. Like, when you're looking at Tottenham, are we realistically going to win a trophy before Harry Kane retires? You would say, looking at our history, probably not. Um, but, you know, going to Man United, which I think is the only club, Man City aren't going to come in for Harry Kane after signing Haaland. Never, ever going to sell to Chelsea regardless. So that's not going to happen. Or Arsenal. So his only real move inside inside England is Newcastle or Man United. Now, look, I know Man United won the Carabao Cup. But you've got to take into consideration the run they had to get there. It's not going to be as easy next season or in seasons to come. Are they going to win a Premier League in seasons to come? Champions League? I'm not convinced by it. I'm not so sure. So, you know, uh, but when you go to a club like United, you're, you're no longer the biggest deal. You're no longer the big week. You don't have that familiar surroundings every day where you're walking in. You've got the same people asking you, how are you? How are your family? All that sort of stuff starts to change. And if you're not made feel like the main man, how does that sort of affect your game? This, that and the other. So the grass isn't always necessarily greener on the other side. And when you look at Tottenham and United over the last few years, we've sort of been on an even keel with them. I think the only team that sort of separates is is, is is the Carabao Cup. But that's because, you know, they took it more seriously than us. So I'm not sure the grass is green and moving to someone like Man United either. And mm-hmm. then, uh, Johnny, get, good to see you in the building, sir. He says, hello, David. Even Harry must know a different manager, no matter how good. And he meant to say is not the issue with the team. I can work a miracle the likes of like, the, the, the liabilities like that. Well, I think Harry Kane knows that. I think, look, if you're Kane, Son, Kulu, or Charleston, you look back with dread every single day. You're looking at them. You're like, the reason why we have to sit behind the ball for 20, 30 minutes at a time is because you guys are useless. You know, the reason why we have, it's our job is harder to score and break teams down because we have to do it from deeper and deeper is because you guys are useless. The reason why we have to try and unlock the door four or five, you know, times every single game is because you guys are useless. I have no doubt I've been in a team like that. You look back at them defenders and you want to kill them. You actually want to kill them. You know, the effort, the sacrifice, the work you're putting in, and you see these guys, you know, scared to do their job. You know, it, 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 it irks you. It pisses you off. And ultimately, you just want to grab hold of them in the dress room and clang their heads together and say, wake up. And after a while, when the same things keep happening, you look back, you know, it does cause arguments. It does cause sort of you not to speak to them and stuff like that. And I have no doubt that's probably going on in the dressing room right now. I have no doubt about it. If you want me to be brutally honest, sure, Ben Davies coming out after the West Ham game. Well, we all sat down there holding hands, telling each other home truths. I mean, that already suggests that there's already a big split, in, in my opinion, in the camp. And I don't think it's between players playing and not playing. I think it's between the forward players and the backline players, if you want me to be brutally honest. Um, but look, Tottenham aren't going anywhere until we learn to keep clean sheets. And that's the reality of it. If you want to win cups, you've got to keep clean sheets. If you want to win a Premier League, you've got to keep clean sheets. So, look, I agree with you, Johnny. I have no doubt, no doubt, my man. That they, the, 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 the Harry Kane and, and even the others in the forward line look back with absolute despair and hate towards these guys. No doubt about it, my man. No doubt about it. Big yourself up, brother. Home truth store. That one really wound me up. I mean, if you're a team that's winning, it's sort of, you should be saying that after every single game. If you're looking to win, you are, even if you do win well, you nitpick them small details and you hash them out so it doesn't happen. You keep people on the top of the game. You shouldn't have to let it get so bad of four or five losses on the bounce before you start telling each other home troops. Honestly, I heard it was that bad. You know, the Ben Davies took the ham out of Harry Kane's ham and cheese sandwich. It's a fucking joke. It's a joke. Anyway. On to the next piece of news, Adam. Um, so that's everything on Harry Kane's contract, which we go into greater detail tomorrow on the debate show, by the way. Um, we have um, John Percy, the Telegraph, Tier 1. Alex Scott is a summer sign, a summer target for Tottenham Hotspur. Um, he's at Bristol City, and they value higher than the record set of 20 million. Reports are saying 25 to 30 sort of million pounds would secure someone like Alex Scott. Me, um, I'll be brutally honest. I'll kick this one off, Adam. Although he's a talent and although he's a guy that Pep Guardiola praised after the recent game, calling him an exceptional player, it's not money we can waste. 25, 30 million with how tight our transfer budgets are and stuff like that. And 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 that it's not something you can throw away on this guy. You know, it has the potential to go someone like, uh, you know, 
and what was his name? Jack Clark, you know, big reputation, came in, never worked out. And this guy has that sort of same, you know, the same risk is there. And for me, that's 25 or 30 million that you add on to whatever you bring your centre back in for. And that means that you can bring in a world class defender. You know, it's 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 the difference between bringing in a world class number one and someone that's, you know, like a Pickford or someone like that. So for me, I think it's a complete waste of money. I don't think you should be spending money on any more youngsters until you get the first team situation sorted out. In my opinion, especially since there's glaring obvious holes in in that first eleven. And yeah, Tottenham have probably you know spent a bit more in recent years, but. You know, that's the difference between getting someone like a Joaquin Anderson or a fucking um, a Bastoni, in my opinion, is that extra 25 to 30 million. So for me, I think it's a complete waste of time. And I don't trust any of these guys bringing in any youth players until that scouting network is sorted out. But Adam, where are you at with this? I completely agree on every every single point you've made. I, I think that, that that money could be better better spent. I think that we do need to look to the future, but that should be done through our academy. The academy needs to be taken care of, make sure that, because we have the likes of, like everyone is going on about how great um, uh, Alfie Devine is, you know, and we've got like, we've got, we've got so many good youngsters that we can train up. And, and if we spend more time developing the academy and then that money that instead of, you know, rather than spending it on Alex Scott, if we spend that money on, getting in you know the 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 really important positions that we need where we're, where we we really break the bank for the players that's going to make all the difference that's going to make the difference for next season in particular if we want to get trophies finally it's going to need to be spending money in the areas that or players walk right into the first team change things and lift the roof off the place and and as well as having two center backs and a goalkeeper come in which is what we really really need if we have that extra bit of cash and you know I'd rather go for I, I i if we're going to bring in a midfielder i like i really really have my hopes set on on james madison i would love james madison to walk in and be the new christian erickson honestly because i think the guy would be able to do incredible things in terms of his free kicks we then have two incredible free kick takers in madison and poro i think that we would be able to we'd have someone who can who can set up absolutely everybody across the front front line as well as scoring cracking goals himself so you know, if we're going to go for for a talented midfielder, there's no reason why why uh, Madison shouldn't be at the top of our list. We need to think big at this point. If we're doing a rebuild, we're doing a rebuild. But right now, we're trying to get the team to be as solid as possible. That 20 million can be better spent. And look, you know, we already have you know someone like Gill. You know, it's uh, you know, it's bringing this guy. I think it's a huge risk. Okay, this guy can play a bit deeper than Gill. Um, but for me, I, I'm just not sure. You know, pinning your hopes on a 19 year old kid. You know, especially when we've got creative problems the way we do. I'm not sure it's the right answer. And I do believe, you know, that, that that's money with, with our transfer windows go. That need to be started. Now, look, I understand that, yeah, you need to be always keeping an eye on the youth to bring in the next best guy and this, that and the other. And I fully understand that when you've got five, six, seven positions still to fill in the first team, for me, it's not money you can afford to waste, especially at Tottenham Hotspur. So for me and Adam, that's a zero. That's a zilch. We do not want them. Um, Skunk Works uh, does say, though, that, uh, you know, listen, don't get me wrong. Alex Scott was a good player, but not sure we could play a woman in the team because there's that woman presenter called Alex Scott as well. So big up, my man. She is a presenter. She is a presenter, my man. And King Hoddle says, you never know. We got Delhi from League One. Look, good point, but look where Delhi Ali is now. You know, it, he didn't have the career that many thought he'd go on to have. It, it was a really... A short sort of spell he had that taught the most success or relative success for Delhi Ali. Since then, he's absolutely fallen off off a hill. So I'll be honest, King Hoddle, I wouldn't be using Delhi Ali as a, as a reference point because for me, you know, completely went south with the guy and it's all his own doing. Um, but big up. And then we've got Lewis says, good night, Dave. I'm going to bed. See you later. I'll text you in the morning. No worries at all, brother. Good night. Have a good one, my man. Uh, we've only got a small bit more news to get through here. And then we will be ending off. Um, Troy Parrott, uh, uh, Adam, uh, he's unsure of his Spurs future. He did an interview with the Irish Examiner, which me and you would know very, very well. Just give me one second and I'll read out exactly what was said. Um, so he said, I'm not sure. I hope I have a future at Tottenham. I've always said that um, that's where I want to play. But we'll see what happens at the end of the season and then go into the summer and take it as it comes. I'm not sure what is going to happen next year, so I am just focused on uh, this 
the last home straight of the season. Then on his injury woes and his knee problem, he added, it's been tough at times because when I came back, I just wanted to go straight away and get back into the team. But obviously I had a talk with the manager and the physios and settle it down a little bit. It was so that I could try to fully recover and get back up to match speed the right way and not rush straight back into it. So that was tough. I was out for a long time, so I just wanted to come back and play straight away. Now I'm 100% uh, fit, so I can play 60, I can play 90, I can play whatever I'm asked to do. I was feeling it, not in terms of the injury, but in terms of sore legs, and that um, it was more sore than normal the next day. So I just had to take a step back a little bit, but now I'm fine. I'm ready to go now. I've had chances, and I believe I'll get more before the season ends. It's just about putting them in the goal now. Now, Adam, my question to you is, do you think Troy Parrott will make it at Tottenham? Let's get a future prediction off you here. And did Troy Parrott ever have a chance to have a future with Spurs? Or was it virtually impossible for him to break into the team? Is there anything he could have done differently? Or has he just been unlucky? I think he's only been unlucky in the sense that he's had to follow in the footsteps of Harry Kane. Like if you're, when we're thinking about who's going to be the next striker for, for Tottenham, you have absolutely enormous shoes to fill. And so, you, you know, there's, he's unlucky in that sense because he's just not the kind of player that is able to hold a candle to, to Harry Kane. He can't tie his, tie his boot, bootlaces. So, uh, the, I look, uh, as I said before, I love a narrative and I would absolutely love to see an Irish guy come up and be the next Robbie Keane. And that would nothing would make me happier, but it's just not going to be the case. He's not shown anything to, to 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 say that that's what he's capable of being. If suddenly he just became a sensation overnight somewhere, if so, like he's, he he wakes up on a different side of the bed one morning and decides to become a could become a different player, you know, it, it's strange things have happened, I guess. But the way things are, the pattern we've seen, you know, you don't you don't assume something will be will be any different when you wake up the next morning than it was the day before. And for him, yeah, he, he, again, he won't hold a, hold a candle to Harry Kane. When, the next time that we're, when, when it's time for Harry Kane to hang up his boots, the next person that comes in that we're looking for, we're going to have seriously high standards. Mm -hmm. And Troy Parrott just isn't that. I feel sorry for Troy Parrott in a way. I think when you look at it in two ways, right? One, you know, you've got Harry Kane there in his prime. So it's sort of that that's a hindrance in itself, and it almost all limits any game time you're going to get. Like, even look at Richardson 24 25 Brazil international, even his minutes have been limited, let alone someone like Troy Parrott trying to make a name for himself coming through the youths into the senior team. But then you also look at it for majority of that time, we've only had Harry Kane. So, you know, you would maybe look at it and say, Is there a window of opportunity missed for Troy Parrott to take them? You know, to be that backup, considering there was only one striker at the time. So I think it's a bit of bittersweet. I think whatever way you want to look at it, you're probably justified too. But the, look, you know, I had high hopes for Troy Parrott. He came through the youth set up. He scored. He scored an awful lot of goals, especially in the UEFA uh, youth league. He was banging in the goals, and I think it was right to sort of loan him out and develop because he did look maybe ahead of his years and look head and shoulders above. Uh, you know, people that, of, of that age. But, you know, since going on loan, I don't think any of them have really worked out. He went on loan to Millwall, hampered by injury, then spent, I think it was the second half of the season on loan at Ipswich in League One. Got a run of games, not a great goal return. MK Dons, he fared a little bit better, 47 appearances, 10 goals. Now he's on loan at Preston this year. Injuries have hampered him again, but he's only scored three goals in 24 games. Not a great return. So I would say I don't think any of his loan spells have really sort of worked out. I don't think he was helped by, you know, being very pally with Deli Alley. Um, I think that's definitely also hindered his career a little. You know, if you're hanging around with someone like Deli Alley, ultimately you must have the same sort of mindsets, I would say, which is maybe not good for a player of Troy Parrott you know, ability with his career, you know, it could very easily end up the same as what Deli Ali's career has been. Troy Parrott has also been known to, you know, sort of being at racing festivals and stuff like that with very well-known gangster sons, stuff like that. So I'm not sure some of the people he hangs around with or he keeps the best of company. Now, it does look like that maybe sort of this summer he sort of copped on to that and realised that. He did say in the interview he changed a lot of things. He came back early and put, put himself into a training camp in Portugal before this season. But despite doing all of that, the season just has not really panned out well for him. 
Um, and you also look at it, right? There's a number of young Spurs forwards on the books. You've got Dane Scarlett, 18 at Portsmouth, very, very highly rated amongst, you know, people in the game. Um, you've got Jamie Donnelly as well, who signed a new three and a half year contract today. Also very, very highly rated within people at Tottenham. Um, you've got 19 year old Jude uh, Sunsuk Bell, who we signed from Chelsea recently. Um, you've got 17 year old Will Lancher, who we signed recently from Sheffield United. So there are a lot of youngsters coming through. And with Troy Parrott being sort of 21, going into 22, I think potentially, because he's also only got two years left on his contract, I think potentially, I think he might get one more loan spell next season. If that is not a roaring success, I think ultimately Tottenham will probably look to cut their ties with the guy. You know, also it's happened to his Ireland career. You know, this is a guy that was given a chance at 17 years of age. You know, he's been given a chance with Ireland, but ultimately he's never really kicked on either in an Ireland jersey. Uh, I think you look at it, you've got the likes of the young guy, Evan Ferguson, coming through at Brighton, who is sort of, you know, Ireland would be looking at to be the main man, whereas once it was Troy Parrott. And 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 uh, trust me, this Ferguson guy has a lot of ability, you know. People are very, you know, I think Liverpool tried to sign him when he was 14. He made his first team appearance for Bohemians in in. In Ireland, I think at 14 or 15 in the preseason game against Chelsea. Um, you know, he ended up there uh, choosing rejecting Liverpool and picking Brighton um, because he believed it was easier to get into the first team at Brighton. And a lot of people are comparing him to Harry Kane, saying he's got a lot of ability. So Troy Parrott has a lot of work to do because I know Tottenham were also looking at young Everson Evan Ferguson. There was um reports out there not so long ago suggesting Tottenham were looking at him as a long-term Harry Kane replacement. So I think when it comes to Troy Parrott, Adam, I think one more year, and if it, if it doesn't kick on, I think you'd probably see the back of him at Tottenham. I doubt Troy Parrott is a name that we'll have on our lips too many times over the rest of the season. Anyway, like for like even even all next season, you'll you'll you may hear of you know once or twice potentially of kind of how he's getting on, but he's not. He's he'll be a thing. He'll be a, a memory before we know it. Honestly. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. It's sad because, you know, I was dying to get an Irish striker on the cards after the likes of the, the great Robbie Keane. Mm -hmm. um, I had to replace the sort of era, that Irish era that Doherty brought, you know, put that in the distant memory. But it looks like it's not the case. And you know what? Troy Parrott is one, of, uh, is one of a number of young players that sort of broke through recent years that have really failed to kick on. I, mean, I think Aaron Connolly at uh, Brighton was a similar case, you know, and he's even alluded to it himself. He wasn't looking after himself, wasn't living his best life. And uh, you know, you're going from a guy that came through at Brighton scoring goals to now on loan at Hull in the in in the in the um in the championship. So I wonder is there maybe something going on there with young Irish guys coming through? And then last but not least, you've got young Jamie Donnelly who signs a new long-term contract at Tottenham. That is three and a half years um that he will be signing. Football London Spurs says um football London says Spurs have high hopes for Donnelly. And understands that the younger is set to seal a new deal for three and a half years at the club. The new contract for the teenager who has played international youth football for both England and Northern Ireland will almost will also contain an option for a further year. Adam, I'm not expecting you to know too much about Jamie Donnelly, to be honest with you. But if we do manage to get Donnelly on loan, like we have Dane Scarlett, is it possible that Spurs could have some top level strikers lined up for the future? when Harry Kane eventually goes. And, and maybe do you think that's the plan with Tottenham saying, look, we're not selling Harry Kane whatsoever, that they are hoping one of Scarlett, Parrott, Donnelly, Sunset Bell, or Will Lancher will eventually come true and take that place. Yeah. And it's a gamble to do that. It's it's entirely possible. I'm not sure that it's a gamble because at the end of the day, like I, I do think Kane will be around for, I think he'll sign. I think he'll be around for a few more seasons. And by that point, you're talking about more revenue, more um you know there'll be there'll be there'll be more money there to, to find someone to replace Kane if we need to anyway but I think it is a you know it's good that we can see names for the future I really really hope that at some stage in the future you'll see a squad an incredible squad with Dane Scarlett up front and Alfie Devine playing you know in the attacking midfield role and it, you know it would be it would be a great uh, as I say it's you know I love stories it would be a great story to see that these young lads are you know come up and they and they, and they push through but as you say yourself um you know you're absolutely right I know nothing about about Jamie Donnelly 
but I all I can say is like if he's if he's part of our future, then I absolutely wish him all the best, and and I'll be uh, I'll be rooting for him every step of the way because because um you know we got we can't just think about the now, we have to think about the future, and and um, and we need to get that academy sorted, and if they're part of a a process of having that academy um uh, completely revamped and 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 pushing for for uh, the, the the future of of our club, then we've got to wish the boys all the best. For sure, I just, I just worry. I don't want Spurs to really hinder any more of them new players' careers coming out. I don't think we source the best loan moves for them at times. I think we could do more due diligence in where we're sending, where we're sending players. I think if you look at something like what United have had under for Sir Alex Ferguson, where they had certain clubs they used to send them out on loan to because they knew they'd be looked after, they knew they'd get game time. But then they had a club like Antwerp in in, in Belgium where. You know, before they were even considered for the first team, they had to go out there and do it for a season. And I do think Tottenham need to get something like that in place on clubs they can trust, where they can send these players, where they will be looked after and get given game time. Because at the minute, if you're a youngster coming through, bar maybe Skip or Harry Kane, the way you look at it is, once you're out on loan, you're sort of never, ever going to get an opportunity at Tottenham. You're sort of out of the eyes, out of any of the eyes of anyone looking. And so it'll be interesting to see how we handle the development of someone like a Scarlett, a Donnelly, Sunset Bell, or a Will Lankshire. Um, but, you know, it is one that they need to handle right because potentially you'd like to think out of one of them, you know, one of them can come come, come true and be decent enough to 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 offer us goals the same way in which Harry Kane offers us goals. Um, Jamie Donnelly, has got 11 goal involvements, I think 24 games for the under-18s this season, that's scoring five, um, setting up six. But he's also a player that doesn't moan, doesn't bitch, doesn't cry. They've had injuries this season. He's been asked to play in midfield, and he's done that. You know, he's shown great versatility. So I think definitely deserves his new contract. But it'd be interesting to see how we develop any of these guys with, with the four of them there. You'd like to think one of them should be should should end up coming through. And Eamon Burns says, David, how was your time in England? And was that your first time meeting Jack? Um, no, I mean, my man, it was my second time meeting Jack. I met him over there last year for the Irish Hotspur Derby against them bubble enthusiasts, West Ham, and bubble merchants, you know, the Irish, uh, anti-Irish Hotspur people. Um, you know, we, we 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 met at that game. Of course, we got the victory and rubbed it in on them as well, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, this time around, good trip, my man. You know, it was great to be welcomed in. I'm sure Adam can attest to this because he was there. Every time I go over, I'm always welcomed in by the locals, by the Tottenham community, you know, showing a great time, you know, showing great respect as well. People come up, uh, you know, saying they love the channel, asking for photos, this, that and the other, which is also also very, very nice. But um, look, my trips over there are always good because the people make it, my man, you know, very welcome. They accept me into the Tottenham community. I love being there, you know, chanting from the terraces, booing, moaning in, in adulation, you know, happy. With, with, with all the Tottenham supporters, it's great. Um, and everything else I do outside of Tottenham, like uh, create content and uh, meet up with people that like the channel and stuff like that, it's also very, very fun. But ultimately, you know, the result and the performance pissed on my parade. I do disagree with what Adam said earlier. I do think the performance was shambolic. I think it was cowardly. I think it was they played scared. Um, not good enough, in my opinion, you know, especially for a, a big European night where it's sort of, you have a chance of going home, so just throw, you know, pedal to the metal or me metal to the floor or whatever it's called and fucking go for it. We didn't do that. That did put a downer on it. But look, you know, my trips are always good, my man. Always good. So, but look, I think that brings us to the end of it. Adam, anything you want to say before we end off, brother? No, just uh, I'm 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 delighted to be back on the show again, man. Like, thanks so much. I always uh, like you know it, it's it's very there's such a, a a gluttony of of um you know we're spoiled for choice in terms of the amount of amazing Tottenham Hotspur shows that are out there. But I never I never fail to uh, to get onto the the Irish Hotspur and 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 check out what you and and Jack are doing on a on, on a regular basis. And I'm 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 delighted to have been able to fill in for Jack, who's lost his voice this evening. So hopefully he gets better. Um, you know I'll be uh, be thinking of you, Jack, and. Uh, we'll be, be chatting uh, very soon I'm sure um, and yeah again thanks for having me on I appreciate it and, and I'll, I'll I'll try and come on as often as I can whenever you'll have me and um, yeah just a little bit of I suppose kind of uh, shameless promotion if you guys want to yeah, check out what I'm, your movie. 
<laughs> if you want to check out what I'm doing, um, my feature film is available on Amazon.co.uk. If you go to Amazon.co.uk and type in "Follow the Dead," you can rent the film for a very, very low price, and you can uh, you can check it out. And if you do, please leave a favorable review, and uh, and uh, and it would be nice to get a, a rating and a review from people to check it out. And it really helps me to kind of boost not only the popularity of the film, but also it's really kind of giving me my best foot forward for my chosen career which is making movies it's what i really want to do so i'd appreciate you checking that out if you want to check me out on social media what it's uh wild stag media wild stag media i always worry that i'm not saying that properly um any on all the all the social media machines so you can check me out there and uh, i appreciate everyone um giving me your support i've been w watching the the comments in the in the in the chat and everything and a lot of people are being very very uh sweet and lovely towards me so i appreciate that thanks so much and, and thank one you, last time, the name of the movie, just for people to check it out so we don't get it lost. Follow the Dead. These Follow the right Dead. Here. There you <laughs> go, everybody. If you could check that out for Adam, give it a good review. It really does help him out and everything he has to do. Personally, you know, I know Adam took a lot of risk to make this, a lot of gamble to take this. Um, you know, so it'd be absolutely brilliant if, uh, you know, we could get behind him and, and, and make it all feel worthwhile for the guy. Also... Um, massive thank you to Adam for coming on tonight. I really do appreciate it. And Adam, hopefully we see a lot more of you around here now, my man, now that maybe life is starting to, you know, get a little bit better. Not easier, but a little bit better <laughs> for you. So hopefully we see a lot more of you around, my man, because I know people love sort of your, your calmness through all the storm. Sometimes you keep me level-headed as well, which I think people <laughs> say is an achievement, Adam, because... You know, I'm very uh, pro to flying off the handle. But guys, lots coming up for the Irish Hotspur. Myself and Jack, we've got a number of uh, series of uh, little teams put together that we want to get released and put out there. One on Tottenham Scouting Department, one on the Defence, one on Hugo Lloris and, and Fraser Forrester. Um, and there's plenty more to come um, of them sort of short videos and stuff like that. So make sure you check out them. We've done a little bit of recording um, while we were over in England as well for sort of something that someone wants to put together, a little documentary and stuff like that. Not right. sure how long that's going to take to come out, but, you know, keep your eyes peeled for that. And also, we've got a very lively debate show tomorrow, um, you know, so make sure you tune in for that as well, and we'll see you all back here tomorrow. As always, come on, you Spurs. In content, we trust. See you all tomorrow. Enjoy your evening, and thank you all for tuning in. You're good souls. I won't let anyone tell you otherwise. See you tomorrow. Come on, you Spurs. Come on, you Spurs.